This Week in Radio Tech. Episode 206 is brought to you by Direct Current, the tech newsletter from the engineers at the Telos Alliance. Direct Current brings you technical articles, tips, and information you can use today. Direct Current is free, useful, and engineer-approved. Visit telosalliance.com slash subscribe. Doug Rowe is an engineer at Minnesota Public Radio, and his title is one we'll see more often, Media Production Systems Manager. What does that all mean? Well, Chris Tarr and I wanted to find out, so we got Doug to tell us, and you'll want to understand what he does, as the radio industry will need more people with his skills. Hey, welcome in. It's time for This Week in Radio Tech. I'm Kirk Harnack, your host. Glad that you're with us. It's our 206th show. Our show is brought to you by Axia and the Axia Element. And I, they're my employer, and I'm just very grateful that they also want to sponsor This Week in Radio Tech. This is the show where we talk about uh, anything with broadcast engineering related, from the microphone that the announcer sits behind uh, to the light bulb at the top of the tower, and now so many new technologies. We're going to spend a bunch of time today talking about streaming and managing lots of streaming and how important that streaming has become. We'll, uh, we'll get into it with Doug Rowe, our guest from Minnesota Public Radio. Let me bring in right now, though, our co-host for the show, Christopher Tarr, the, uh, the ninjaneer, the geek Jedi from Muckwanago, Wisconsin. Hey, Chris, glad you're here. And you're quiet. Is it just me? Nope, it's me, too. Oh, sorry. I was trying to be polite by muting so that when I coughed, you wouldn't hear it. I got to remember to unmute it when I'm done. So as I was saying, <laughs> among those other things, genuinely nice guy, director of uh, radio and opera, uh, radio operations at Radio Milwaukee in Milwaukee, uh, radio guide, magazine writer, uh, co-founder of the site broadcastengineering.info, a uh, bunch of kids, a bunch of radio stations. I never sleep. Help me. <laughs> Chris, you're, you have a new set. You're not uh, I'm actually uh, I'm home from work today because I have this uh, bronchial thing going on. So I'm actually in my living room. I'm sitting at the kitchen table. Ah, okay. And usually it's a little bit too rowdy around there for you to uh, be at the kitchen. Right. Table. At, at night, when we were doing the show at night, I had to be in my bedroom because the kids were running around. But right now it's just <laughs> me and over in the corner my dog. So we're good. Oh, oh. Have we seen your dog? Uh, no, you have not seen my dog. You ever want to play show and tell? Well, you know, here, let me let me lift the, the uh, see if I can lift it up here. <laughs> He's actually behind me on the couch. If you look uh, Chris. right. Oh, almost, almost. No, still uh, there he is up on the couch behind me. See his, okay. see his nose there? Yeah, right behind close. my chair. Yep, there you yeah. go. He's yeah. white, so it kind of blends <laughs> it. There you go. There's my dog sitting there pining for me because I'm not around. I'm, I'm talking and not petting him. <laughs> I got a couple of cats, and there's no way I can get them on the show. <laughs> they just—they don't—they don't mind. <laughs> it's the nature of. Yeah, my cat. My cat. I have a cat too, and she's around somewhere. I don't know where she's at. Oh. D- does yours mind? What you say? I guess that's a no. <laughs> I just wonder if Chris is still hearing us or not. All right, let's go ahead and move to our guest. Our guest is Doug Rowe, and uh, Doug is with Minnesota Public Radio. Let's bring Doug in. Hi, Doug. How you doing? Hi, good, thanks, Kirk. How you doing? Good. Uh, boy, it seems like you and I met uh, some years ago, didn't we, At, uh, at there at your place of business? Yeah, so uh, here at MPR, we actually were one of the first big Axia installations, uh, roughly 2005, early 2006. Uh, We were, uh, for a little while, one of the largest Axia networks, I think, that Axia even had around. Now I know there's a number of other folks who have eclipsed us. But um, uh, at this point in time, we're still running a full facility with about four primary services coming out of our building, as well as doing uh, Axia installs at some of our sister stations at Southern California Public Radio and uh, Axia installs at... Uh, Figaro Courtyard, which is Marketplace Productions out in L.A. So lots of Axie experience, lots of, uh, lots of gear throughout our facilities here. So it's a lot of fun to get to take care of and spend time with. And uh, uh, one, one thing I'll, I want to make sure folks understand we're going to talk about, where it's not, it's not an Axie show, although that'll play a little bit into it. Um, Doug's title, I, I'm not sure it would quite fit <laughs> in the lower third. Uh, Doug, your title is Media Production Systems Manager. Media Production Systems Manager. That's a 
a big title, but it, it, we were talking her before the show and seems very appropriate for the kind of work that you do. And the kind of work you do is not something that most radio stations have yet or have somebody in your position. So let's talk a little bit about about what you do at Minnesota Public Radio and American Public Media there in, in your building in, uh, in St. Paul. Sure. So uh, I started out as a more traditional broadcast engineer, you know, transmitter site, studio facility maintenance, the, the normal list of things that uh, folks do. As a large organization, we always also had a, a full-time or still do have a full-time uh, corporate IT team. And one of our challenges throughout the years at, at NPR and APMG has been um, balancing computer-based systems for broadcast uh, versus computer-based systems for you know general computing, whether it be you know accounting firms or accounting or uh, word processing or whatever else, and so it's it's always kind of had this gap for us where there's this the, the you never know where things should fall into. Should the I, traditional IT team buy PCs for the studios? Um, should mm. if so, should they be the ones to maintain the software on there? Where is that line? You know, you say, oh well, it's you know, uh, engineering takes care of the broadcast software, IT takes care of the PC. Well, what if it's a sound card driver issue? You know, is that a? It's always been kind of a gray area. So, in an effort to try to better cover this type of technology, uh, a couple of years ago, NPR started a media production systems department, and we're 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 basically bridging the gap. I mean, we're uh, at this point in time tier two for Axio, especially when it comes to to networking, working closely with our um, full time network engineer that that works in the corporate IT team uh, corporate IT team side. Uh, at the same time, um, we're the the primary administrators and instigators for our digital media system uh, software that we're in the middle of a project right now. Um, primary administrators for a number of ENCO systems around our facility and around the network, working closely with the engineers. And then, of course, working closely with the IT teams for uh, the infrastructure and and administration of all of our web streams, the interconnectivity to those web streams, to uh, uh, stream guys and ads whiz as, as we've been trying to grow that side of the business. Um, and then, of course, the day-to-day -day support of all the folks using Pro Tools and Dalit and whatever else they can dig off the internet for use uh, in audio production and um, newsroom newsroom workflows, as well as uh, the same thing for our classical and uh, rock and roll services, making sure they have all the content that they need and the formats that they need it, and are able to get it the places they want it to go. So it's it's a very fun position. Some of the, the stuff you're describing is, is kind of mind-blowing for me, who I've been a, a workaday engineer. Uh, the, you know, the biggest place I've worked at, I, I guess, is where we ran um, eight radio stations uh, years ago out of uh, uh, Cleveland, Mississippi, just small stations, ran them out of one control room. A and what you're describing to me is, is just, is, is, I mean, I've been there. It's big. You've got dozens and dozens and dozens of people with with workstations you know for doing editing you you've got your distribute uh, you know for different networks you you've got you, as you said four you know program feeds that go out of of your place uh live to transmitters and then you've got you know, other distribution networks and web streams and so forth uh, this, <laughs> it's, it's it's really amazing uh how much stuff goes on at a place uh as big as Minnesota Public Radio and and American Public Media there um, boy, maybe you could just talk a little bit about that, about the scope of of what you guys do as far as generating content and then and then delivering it. Sure, absolutely. Well, I mean, as everything has changed with the internet um, and and the ability for downloading and streaming and you know a variety of other devices upon which you can receive content, uh, our corporate mentality has turned from being a radio station or a network of radio stations to a content producer and media distribution uh, network. And so obviously the you know Minnesota Public Radio FM broadcast is a big component of that and still technically our largest component. Um, as far as our, our mentality goes, it, it is still no more important or, or I should say the streams and other um, vehicles for distribution are no less important than the FM broadcast. You know, a, a double-digit percentage of our listeners are tuning into web streams all around the world. Um, you know, daily there there's hundreds, if not thousands, of downloads of our content via podcasts or um, yeah, via podcasts, via direct downloads, via um, third-party services like our iHeartRadio or Stitcher or you know whomever else. I mean, there's there's all kinds of folks we we are tempted to be affiliated, or even the the iTunes Apple iTunes Store. Um, and so our goal is 
you know, not just to support those things, but to make sure that, that there is a high level of reliability, at least as high level of reliability as, as the expectation has always been for the FM transmitter sites. Um, as a company, you know, Minnesota Public Radio, as I said, is the, the primary organization, but we're actually a parent of American public media. Um, mm-hmm. As a function of, of that uh, um, relationship between the, organiza- the two organizations, you know, we have just as much emphasis on content distribution for our own services as we do for um, you know, other stations that may carry a Prairie Home Companion or other programs in, in the same respect and vein that National Public Radio and Public Radio International function at this point in time. So there's definitely... A, uh, we have tried to take the mentality that you know we need to to approach these streams as something that's um, you know just as important and need to be just as reliable as the day to day broadcast, and you know both as a respect for our content production and for for our listeners who expect those things to be there, you know not to have that would uh, could in many cases disillusion a listener or have somebody not want to find our content because they don't think it's accessible. And well, I guess not only you know desiring to have the the reliability on on the streams, but you've the interesting thing about streams, and you guys, you know, have all this ability to make content. Uh, in the terrestrial broadcast world, you're limited by the number of transmitters and the number of licenses uh, that that you have and you can transmit with. With the internet and streaming, you're you're pretty well unlimited. If you can justify, you know, another stream with some, you know, some niche of programming that people will listen to, I guess you just make it right. Absolutely. I mean, it, it's interesting when I think about the history. I think the supplemental channels and HD radio for us actually were the beginning driver of that, where we started to say, well, you know, what else could we put out there? And since then, you know, even even there, we were limited to only one or two additional services per station. Well, since that point in time, um, you know, we've we've moved to a point where uh, we've started you know, looking at the web stream as being the the initiation for many services that sometimes even have grown then into an FM broadcast. Um, you know, uh-huh. the, the the popularity of a web stream changing what we may actually put on the radio at some point in the future. Um, I've seen that driven the most with, with The Current, which is our, our uh, uh, rock station. The, the Current is a, a kind of eclectic mix of... Um, oh, I don't know the best way to describe it, but, you know, it, it's kind of a mix of... of styles of music with a lot of emphasis on local Minnesota artists. Um, but classical is definitely getting into that. And of course, news content, you know, the idea of breaking news, especially in, in a, a global oriented perspective has become very important. You know, we, we, um, in the twin cities here have populations of people who are very interested as to what's happening in Egypt, very interested what's happening in Somalia because it hits close to home, even though they may be, you know, 3000 miles away. Yeah, and so yeah. for us, it, it's, it's a, it, it's both a responsibility to our listeners and then, of course, you know, an opportunity for us to get our content out to folks and to you know, really push the Minnesota Public Radio, American Public Media name to, and bring content that people enjoy. So, This is a show where we, we do talk about tech, and so I just want to kind of get sure. that set up. And also, I'm, I'm glad that Chris Tarr was able to join us today um, for, for being a co-host on the show since Chris – well, he's not, not – I, I, you know, I guess Wisconsin, Minnesota, you guys are a little bit rivals, but Chris also is, uh, has been and is in the world of, of public community radio. And so I figured that you two might have some things to talk about, and Chris might be able to ask you questions from a perspective that would, uh, would, would, would go past me. So uh, I'm glad Chris – Chris, are, are you back with us? Everything okay? I am right here. Yes, my internet went good. stupid for a little bit there, but we're good. <laughs> Good deal. Well, I'm sure you've got a couple things that you want to ask Doug, uh, Doug about, and and uh, so certainly uh, we we will want to get into some of the technical things that that Doug does, and maybe he's got some lessons to teach us. Maybe there's some techniques that uh, he could tell us about that he's found particularly helpful when you're managing uh, streaming and lots of of streaming. But uh, uh, Chris, you got something you want to uh, talk to Doug about? Actually, now, yeah, I've been following along. You know, it's funny. The Current is actually kind of a sister station to Radio Milwaukee. We do a lot sure. of content sharing and, and things like that. And we actually have a very similar setup in terms of Venco and, and with streaming and, and Axia and things like that. So I'm actually interested in hearing how he's using that. And I think one thing that, that I would add to to what uh, what Doug was saying, he probably, uh, you know, can can expand on that a little bit. But uh, you know, when you're talking about uh, wanting, having the content available when listeners – want to go to get it. Uh, I think that's a very important thing that public radio does because we're supported, uh, you know, a good part of our support comes from our listeners. They, you know, directly, we cut out the middleman and they hand us their money directly. And one of the important things about my job and, and Doug's job 
is to make sure that that content is available, that things are functioning and they're working efficiently so that that content gets into the hands of the end users. And uh, so I'll be interested to kind of hear more about uh, some of the steps he's taking to do that because that is a, a very important part of what we do in public media is making sure that the content is available to the people who are paying us to, to put it together for them. Sure, absolutely. So, oh, Sorry, go mm-hmm. ahead. Go ahead, Doug. No, no, oh. I, no you go ahead and ask that. I got some more coming up. Um, yeah, so I mean, I mean, for us, it, it's in the last couple of years, especially as as the the emphasis on these alternate means of delivery have uh, uh, been pushed within our organization. We, we've had a lot of focus on redundancy um, and a lot of focus on um, not so much disaster recovery, but backup systems and the able uh, ability to um, uh, find alternate paths or alternate ways to maintain content to our to our listeners in the end you know so from a streaming perspective that both is internally in the facility and externally with with our uh, contracted streaming vendor of making sure that you know we, we have high availability um, redundancy load balancing um, and you know for us it's really become a focus of just investing in the technology and the hardware to do that I mean that it's not that the technology hasn't existed it's just that previously I, th- I think the expense has been hard to justify and and now for us instead it's become something that to us has become very important. And, and the expectation that you know, just like an FM station, little or no downtime. You know, even though it's just a web stream, quote unquote, it's no longer just a web stream. It's another service. So, Doug, or Doug earlier you was, mentioned that that, that the, I'm sorry, the the, the stream uh, the streams you're running have you said double digit uh, listenership, and maybe in terms of of your total listenership. How what math did you use to determine when the streams became important enough that you would make sure that they're robust and that you would sure. pay more atten- not just make it not just the you know redheaded stepchild but you'd actually pay attention sure. to them sure and and I'll I'll say if somebody went and fact checked me I'm I'm guessing we're getting close to that I I, I don't know the exact number in our ratios but uh, <laughs> if one of our folks here at NPR tunes in and says well wait a minute no I'll I'll say I'm I'm guesstimating on that but I know uh, for us it, part of what has helped is the the Arbitron PPM aspect of things so that's giving us you know some significant r- number of readouts or some you know ability to compare across services across different aspects um, APMG is as a larger organization we're lucky enough that we actually have a department here that's you know dedicated to that type of business analysis and, and data analysis and is able to put that information together for our board and for our um, uh, directors and uh, administrative staff to be able to actually influence those decisions about you know where the money should go you know should we be uh, I mean if the debate was buy a new transmitter because one's off the air or buy streaming gear the transmitter still would probably come first but uh, you know as, as we then look at hardening infrastructure that's definitely something that keeps coming up over and over as a, as a content distribution company not just a radio station now Doug are you finding I, I, I'm finding and this is a you know I'm now 18 months into public media coming from the commercial world Sure. Are you finding that expenditures are are really in a good way? Uh, expenditures are really moving towards equipment and capital uh, in, in your facilities. Well, I've noticed recently, like for example, you know, I've been looking at doing an Enco upgrade. It didn't take a lot. It didn't take a real hard sell to get them to to make that change. Uh, but I'm finding that, and I'm seeing this at, at stations across the country that uh, all of a sudden now there's been and you know in a good way a focus put on the the technology to create the content you know whereas before well you know if you had a 15 year old console eh, it's still working but now all of a sudden it's you know we need to uh, you know have these te- these these newer technologies because we have all this content that needs to be created and they become a lot less hesitant to to invest in that at least that's that's kind of what I'm finding are you seeing the same thing um, I mean from from my experience it's definitely very capital driven I mean that's that's the um, uh, one of the things, even when I first started at NPR, that I noticed is uh, operational expenses probably stay pretty pretty steady, um, at least from the technology side. Very capital driven. Uh, you know, if we're, if we're going to make a choice as to how we run a project, are we going to take it out of operational R and M or capital? Capital seems to oftentimes be the first choice. Um, you know, and leaving the R and M monies for us for the you know more day to day. Hey, this thing broke. You know, a knob came off my hand. Send it somewhere to fix it, or, or you know, internally decide to fix things. Um, the the hard thing is just making the decision. Where do you put that money in? And it, as we've gone through our facility, I mean, we went through a a, a significant building addition uh, in two thousand four through two thousand six. That's that's when we initially added Axia uh, into our facility. Well, we're 
eight years, you know, coming up almost now on nine years uh, with with our Axie systems, um, with our play to air systems, um, with all the the equipment that we installed at that point in time, and you know, technology has changed. Mm-hmm. I mean, for for us, the the Axia core, as an example, that we purchased uh, eight years ago is now. If we were to buy the equivalent, it's probably overpowered and at the same time, uh, you know, underfeatured for the things that we actually want a system to to be able to do for us. You know, it doesn't have the redundancy that we want, and at the same time, it you know is probably a much uh, higher level corporate core that you know we, we we wouldn't spend the same money. We'd put the money in a different place or for different gear. Um, so, as you know, kind of a random example there. So where where do you? Where do you look to kind of find out where you know out to the horizon to find out where you're going to uh, you know with technology, and what is the appropriate uh, technology to look at? You know, for example, um, you know I'm I'm imagining that a lot of this kind of starts with the germination of an idea with your programming people or you know your production staff, and then you know I find you know you kind of have to be you know pretty much right up with them in terms of okay well, well if that's where we're going here's where we need to look and here's what we need to look at. You know, how do you, how do you find yourself keeping on top of technology in order to be able to satisfy those requirements? Sure. So, so for us, um, as, as I've watched this process and you know, I'm not going to say it's always hundred percent of the time like this, but as I've watched this process, what, what I oftentimes see is, um, mandate isn't, isn't the right word, but a, a strong influence coming from, uh, uh, the, content folks in the organization to want to be able to either create something new or do something more efficiently. So th- those are oftentimes the, the you know, germinations of ideas. So it's not necessarily, hey, we want to do this show and we want it to have, you know, X and put that together for us. But instead it's, hey, you know, in, in our newsroom right now, we're sending, uh, copying, pasting things out of our ENPS system and putting them into emails to send them to the web producers who are then producing that but not getting updates uh, as a story progresses throughout the day because people forget to email them. You know, what kind of system can we put together that, that might help with that? Or, um, you know, we are... Uh, putting together content for radio broadcast and it's getting dubbed on a CD and that CD is getting carried down the hallway to somebody who then rips that audio off of the CD into an MP3 to turn around and post it on the web. H- how could we make this more efficient so that we don't, you know, we're not burning CDs or people aren't having to walk things around? Um, the that in combination with then uh, the the support and, and encouragement and emphasis from higher management that we want to just you know make things more reliable that we want to have higher percentages of uptimes we want to take fewer outages when you put those two things together it, it gives us in technology an opportunity to put together um, capital requests or, or project plans for things that that you know really move us forward in terms of the mission or the goals um, uh, that the programming department would like to see in combination with making sure that we have the right mentality that the systems we put together are going to be highly available and highly redundant. Um, as far as figuring out what those technologies are, um, oftentimes the need drives the desire to go look for the technology. When we begin looking at the technology, then you know it's your it's your normal sources, whether it be looking at NAB um, or going to NAB, looking at at, at folks there and having conversations, um, talking to other fellow public broadcasters, talking to National Public Radio or PRI, um, talking to uh, other folks in the industry. You know, being having some connections in the industry certainly helps you hear about things. You know, people who've moved from job to job, and you know they end up with a vendor who has this product that. When you start, you know, chatting with your friend, you find out that that somebody uh, has something that you really could use that's going to solve a problem for you. So it's you know a variety of ways to learn about the technology. Uh, I will say as well for Minnesota Public Radio, we, we um, tend to have strong partnerships with the technology vendors that that we choose, and within those partnerships, we tend to um, pursue development for new things that that those vendors may not you know may have thought about but are not necessarily doing at the time. Um, an example for that, well, a couple examples. When we did our Axia project originally in, in 2004, 2005, um, that was the big push for Element. Um, we were one of the first stations to use Element regularly throughout our building. And there's a some development that was done for soft buttons and scripting and other things that allowed us some automation functions. Um, same thing right now, we're, we're in the middle of a large Dalit project here at NPR. Um, we've rolled out our newsroom onto, onto uh, Dalit Digital Media Systems. Um, 
we're in the process of rolling our current, the current and our classical music services. Um, we have commissioned development from Dalit. You know, we, we, uh, in the, the interest of integration, we uh, ask them to develop against the IP audio driver so that we are now able to use the Axia IP audio driver on um, our broadcast servers and production workstations. Um, we're working with them on a music master integration that will allow us for a, a fairly seamless, seamless ability to um, schedule and reconcile and keep the metadata sets between music, our Music Master scheduling software and uh, Dalit play-to-air system, keeping you know, information together. Along the same lines, we have an internal development team, so we're constantly looking for opportunities. Um, for instance, we have a, a fairly homegrown digital media archive that spans back you know, 20, 30 years. I mean, there's a, we're constantly digitizing older reels and things. We want to make that available internally for search for the newsroom or, or um, classical folks or whomever. You know, if uh, Yo-Yo Ma came and visited 20 years ago and he's going to be coming back, we need our classical folks to be able to search for that recording and pull it up. Um, for us, the integration point to Dalit and to the web and uh, ability for people to access that content both internally and when appropriate externally, um, you know, really again, drives this idea as a, a content-driven company. So, we've been talking about uh, this operation uh, at a rather high level. You know, a, a lot of ideas here. Uh, I wonder, Doug, if if we could get you to kind of tell us what's under the hood. You know, uh, sure. I, I'm curious about yeah, yeah, what's hooked to what. You know, the leg bones connected to the ankle bone. I want to I want to hear about how you're getting things from you know, where the content is made and then, you know, what's the process at, after that? I, obviously, sure. it ends up at, at Stitcher or uh, you, you know, TuneIn or what, your website. So can you take a us through absolutely. that? So, um, you know, focusing a, a little more on, on the content production as opposed to the specific radio broadcast side, um, Dalit Digital Media System is becoming, uh, it said it, the project is in process right now, but is becoming our um, primary play to air, but also... Uh, along those lines, our primary, primary media asset management system. Um, so Dalit for us isn't just a you know hit the button and listen to the audio go, but it's also an, an integrated audio editing tool um, in in uh, uh, tandem with Pro Tools. You know, so depending on the project size, uh, we'll, we'll use Pro Tools or Dalit's uh, one cut audio editor. Um, but that also has become our new, our primary newsroom. Um, and for classical, our primary you know scripting tool as well. So we, we've you know, we're previously using ENPS. We've moved away from ENPS into Dalit for script writing. Um, the ability to take these uh, produced audio elements, drop them into scripts, uh, add in all of the uh, needed asset management fields. You know, so Dalit has the ability to customize asset manager forms. Um, take that, design the forms with the information that we need, depending on the the user's particular needs. So someone from the current may see different fields than uh, somebody in the newsroom does, uh, and then use Dalit's tools for audio export for um, uh, asset management export as terms of, or asset export as far as the actual metadata component goes um, into XML, and then hitting a variety of systems that then have the ability to parse that XML, grab that audio file, do conversions if necessary, and uh, uh, ideally automatically upload that to the web or to our, our websites or to the third party folks. So, I mean, our, our, one of our big pushes right now is to get away from the manual clicking step steps. You know, it used to be mm -hmm. that, again, somebody copied, pasted things out of ENPS and copied a file out of Descart, which was, or, or Netia, depending on which service was, uh, um, uh, uploading content. And then, you know, manually copying something into a web form, uploading something and, hoping the two things you know, looked well together when it got to the website. Um, a lot of our push now is to try to automate that, to try to get this to be a, a one-click step where you know an approval step says, yes, this is ready, and the systems take care of getting the content where it needs to be. Um, our other push with along, along this, of course, as we do content, is trying to um, uh, uh, make the content sound as good as we can. And, of course, the standards for web... Um, be, because of of encoding, because of you know bit loss as as we go through that, uh, sometimes slip a little bit. Well, for us, uh, we've been investing in Minnetonka audio uh, uh, audio encoding and audio processing software. So as a part of this process, we're able to export something for Dalit, hit Minnetonka Audio, and do um, not just an encode to you know MP3 or MP2 or FLAC or whichever, but also do loudness, um, do some um, uh, EQ, depending on the, on if that's going to improve, what that's going to sound like, and allow us to really put our best foot forward 
no matter the type of content we're putting on the web. So that's actually part of this whole workflow process as well as you know a series of watch folders or a series of drop points that are all triggered based on status changes that are all coming out of uh, the, the parent play to air system, uh, which includes the metadata that's important for our users as well. So. Wow, my my head's kind of spinning, Doug. This is <laughs> this is it's, so different than than what uh, me at, at my little radio stations and what so many of my colleagues at other, you know, small groups of stations do. And yet, what you're talking about is the future of where a lot of folks need to go, or some folks already are there. Um, but you guys certainly seem to be l leading the way uh, in terms of work technology and then the workflow that uses that that technology. Absolutely, you know, and and the, the the challenges with any of these, I mean, it's doesn't sound technology, but the workflow is always the thing that that pushes a lot of this innovation. You know, as I said, getting away from having to have somebody sit in a room and double clicking a bunch of things in order to make something happen. The question always yeah. comes up: Well, is this is there a way to automate this? But you know, our our assumption is even if we automate it, it needs to be a high level of reliability. You know, we can't have automation breaking down. We can't have it failing because if the content doesn't, you know, if, if there's a breaking story and the content doesn't make it up. Um, or makes it up after, uh, you know, well after the fact. At that point in time, we've missed our audience. They've either gone somewhere else, or or if they haven't gone somewhere else, you know, they're they're disappointed that they're not seeing the thing as it happened. Um, and and we certainly hear about that from our listeners. You know, so I mean, technology is important, but it's it's again, it's listener driven, and our our listener needs are driven by the content that we produce. Um, along those same lines, of course, you know, as I said, I've mentioned Axie a number of times. we we're, we're integration is is one of our big things that we're really pushing. So the ability to integrate Axie and Dalit, the ability to um, you know, not not just have Dalit be our, our you know, dropping a bunch of files places, but also being our primary playback tool, integrating directly with Axia for for um, of course there's cost savings for us, you know, not having to 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 wire out GPIO nodes, not having to, you know, invest in, in sound cards and you know, higher level PCs where we can do things in the server room. Um, all those things again fall into the same idea of um, of being able to deliver a high quality product to our audiences and make sure it's highly reliable, but also make sure that we're not uh, reinventing wheels or or having to take extra steps to get that content to the end places. Um, the ability for on the Axia side to be able to multicast is huge. You know, that the fact that we can have one room hitting multiple nodes across a variety of devices and do audio different audio processing processing for each of those devices yeah. with just a couple of clicks of a button is also a huge thing for us. Um, you know, we we have as I said, four primary services, but we have with our HD supplementals, we have probably another seven on air services, if I remember correctly. But we have I think about sixteen web streams and and in the works ideas for probably another ten. Many of those automated, so many of those coming out of Dalit, but you know, always wanting to make sure we have the appropriate audio processing and are making sure that's not just, you know, slapping a a uh, Winamp playlist on the radio and saying it's okay, but instead <laughs> making sure it's it's high quality and gonna be there and reliable when we need it. Um, Wait a minute! Isn't that how support. you do it? You slap a Winamp playlist on the on the stream? I I it, it's, I would probably get a dirty lick from my boss, but I'll admit we probably have a couple of those playing somewhere. But there's also <laughs> detailed plans as to how to replace that and uh, exactly. make it better. So, <laughs> hey, we're uh, you're watching uh, this week in Radio Tech episode number two hundred six. I'm Kirk Harnack along with Chris Tarr, uh, who's in Muckwanago, Wisconsin, uh, and uh, we're talking to Doug Rowe. Uh, Doug is the media product media production systems manager at Minnesota Public Radio and uh, their daughter company, uh, American Public Media. Uh, he does a lot of things with them, including um, uh, helping them set up streaming and studios in other locations. Minnesota Public Radio apparently isn't just limited to the confines of the state of the great state of Minnesota. So we'll be talking about that in a few minutes. And I want to hear more specifics about, hey, how do you uh, work out uh, what audio processing is, is sounds right for a stream? And and then I'm also interested in, in hearing about specifically, you know, what, what uh, kind of things go to... Um, uh, be a podcast that you can download versus the, the live streams and kind of how that workflow works. But in the meantime, our show is uh, brought to you in part by my employer, the folks at uh, Telos Alliance. And I want to tell you about something that's new at Telos Alliance. It is a newsletter. Okay. <laughs> newsletter, but this is cool. I mean, I look forward to this thing showing up in my email box. It's called Direct Current. There you go, Direct Current. In, and here's the one that just came out a few minutes ago. In fact, during the show here, uh, I just received this one. Um, 
here's an article, what you need to know about digital audio delay. <laughs> this is kind of cool. The first audio delays were tube-based, but they were garden hose, that kind of tube. Did you know that? A speaker at one end, a microphone at the other. Uh, today's radio broadcasters can take advantage of technologies that are quite a bit more sophisticated for audio delay as well as for shrinking and stretching program material. There's more information on that article. Go down a little bit more, and uh, this kind of has been making news. Uh, uh, that is that the TELUS Alliance has um, it doubled, in some cases, or increased the warranty for all products to five years. So it was Axia products that were five years, and now... The division that I run, Telos, uh, all of our products are now guaranteed, warranted for five years. So our Omnia, uh, 25-7, and Linear Acoustic. So a five-year warranty, brand new, uh, something that we're going to uh, really uh, let people know about at the NAB show, but we're letting you know about it right now. And if you register your product, that is retroactive to January 1st of this year. So if you've already purchased something this year, uh, January 1st, you can go register your product online and the warranty is you know, retroactively effective for, for five years. Uh, a little farther down, uh, <laughs> interesting article about found in the attic, the Studer A710 cassette deck. A little fun that we have there. And there's always a little blurb or often a little blurb about what we did uh, last week on This Week in Radio Tech in case you want to be a, have a reminder to catch up that way. Um, Direct Current is the name of the newsletter. You can sign up for it by simply going to the website telosalliance.com. Telosalliance.com. And uh, if you scroll on down toward the bottom of the page, you'll see a link for subscribe to Direct Current way down near the bottom of the page. Uh, just sign up for it, and we'd be glad to count you as somebody who uh, receives and, and uh, perhaps even reads Direct Current. Uh, I think it comes out about every week or so. Uh, you know, if it's too often for you, you can easily unsubscribe. We've got all that working the way you're supposed to. Uh, but I've, I've found it really enjoyable. Uh, the guys who put that together... Uh, just do a great job and, and so check it out direct current from the TELUS Alliance that's all we'll talk about is, um, uh, is, is that newsletter boy if we could just get everybody subscribed to that I think you're going to find it quite enjoyable and informative uh, informative too hey how else would you know about the five year warranty unless you, unless you read it there or maybe you saw it on Facebook all right, uh, we're talking to Doug Rowe on this episode number 206 of This Week in Radio Tech I'm Kirk Harnack along with Chris Tarr Chris you still with us? I sure am. All right. Uh, now, I don't know about you, but I'm dying to know what Doug and, and his colleagues, what their criteria is for are for um, deciding on processing. Not, not necessarily the brand of processor. I, you know, it'd be great if they use ours from time to time. But how do you decide how you're going to uh, you know, uh, uh, do processing on a classical stream versus uh, a, you know, a, a talk, instructional programming, th that kind of thing? Doug? Can you uh, can you speak to that? Uh, sure. So um, we we have been investing. Uh, we have a combination of or a, a, both a group of Omnias and so, and some Optimods as well, or uh, Orban Optimods. Uh, the lower bit rates, so I like believe the Omnia ones, and I think they're like Optima Optimod sixty or Orban sixty two hundreds or sixty five hundreds. I can't remember which one. Um, but the idea there is they're they're optimized for lower bit rate streams, um, both for streams and HD radio. Um, mm -hmm. As far as the actual content processing, uh, it's a combination of our program directors, um, one or two of our, our more golden ear hosts, and then we're lucky enough to have an entire ops team here uh, at Minnesota Public Radio that you know does concert recordings. I mean, we record the St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, Minnesota Orchestra, all kinds of groups. Uh, getting those folks into a room, into a good listening environment, and really honestly just tweaking things uh, and, until it, they, it is what it, you know, what they think it should sound like. Um, obviously, you know, opinions on that ran, run the gamut, you know, and oftentimes <laughs> it is mostly just that an opinion. Um, I'll say at one point in time, I, I have dialed a couple of those in and I knew that one, uh, one of our hosts who at once absolutely zero processing in his show and the other host who wants it to sound like a, uh, local R&B station when they both were really angry at me because they thought it sounded terrible. I thought it was pretty close. We actually haven't moved it too far since then. So, <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, as far as, you know, what that ideal sound is, I mean, for a classical station, it's, I think from an operations standpoint or somebody who, who has a good set of ears, it's what sounds the, the, um, 
most natural, but taking into account the fact that many of our listeners are listening in a car or are listening in non-ideal environments, you know, whether it's earbuds on a subway or, you know, an FM radio or in their car or in a house full of kids with, you know, a mono speaker, um, you know, web radio uh, sitting up on their countertop or something like that. We have to take all those things into account. Um, Along those same lines, you also, I think, in in the in your market, of course, have to take into account what your competition is doing. So for FM broadcast, you know, we 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 did um, using a Golden Eagle, uh, opti- uh, what is it, Aztec, um, Aztec Golden Automat- Eagle. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Automated Aztec Golden Eagle. We 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 did um, spectrum recordings and um, or not spectrum, but uh, uh, audio recordings and. And analyze that both uh, as far as loudness went and as far as uh, where we saw folks modulating. Um, and, and then, you know, had folks listen to that and made adjustments to our, our rock station to not match, but to what we felt was competitive with the, the local stations. Um, along those same lines, you know, for the news and information side of things, uh, of course, it starts in the studio. So, I mean, you know, we, we were careful about mic selection, um, you know, throughout the entire air chain, what processing mm-hmm. we need. And then it's it's based again on what our, our competitors are doing as well, in addition to just what our operational folks sound good. You know, so just because someone chooses ultra bass for their talk radio show doesn't mean that we'll necessarily do that. But at the same time, we want to be sure that that folks in the car or folks listening in a not an ideal environment don't hear us disappear when they tune to our station or dial in our web stream. So do you have, do you have uh, you know, sort of guidelines for producers and content creators in terms of, uh, you know, audio quality, uh, recording setup, things like that? Because obviously, you know, garbage in, mostly garbage out. So you sure. know, you really, there's a lot of quality control on the front end as this content goes in. Do you have guidelines set up for producers like that? Y- y- yes. And, and so, I mean, one thing that helps us here here at NPR is, is we are uh, – I, the majority of our content is produced by staff in house. So, I mean, that, you know, as opposed to having contractors or folks submitting things to us, that does help give us a certain degree of control that, you know, if, if it was purely uh, freelancers sending in things, you know, you, you maybe run into that a little bit more where y- you don't have as much control over the actual recording process. Um, you know, of course, our concert recordings and things are, are professionally done from our operations team. So, in that sense, you know, we know we'll be getting a high quality um, file. Along those lines, though, still, uh, the majority of our content is recorded out in the field on Marantz recorders, um, typically mono, just to save save disk space. Although most everything is stereo, once it gets in house, we'll we'll you know uh, uh, do L plus R on, on as far as the stereo or as far as production goes. Um, uh, but they'll do it, use a Marantz recorder, usually WAV files, 44.1 kilohertz, uh, 16-bit recordings. Um, they'll bring those in if, if they need to submit something remotely, if it has to go over a 4G or 3G network and you know bandwidth is a concern. Um, typically, they'll use a, a standalone Dalit editor or, or an editor of their choice and drop uh, compress those files usually as, as FLAC files. Um, Six to one, I think, is usually the ratio they choose to use. Um, upload that via FTP or a, a Windows drop folder if they're able to get a solid VPN connection. Um, once it gets back into our system, uh, just to s- Dalit does have the ability to, to to convert on the fly. So you can you can mix sample rates, you can mix bit depths, um, you can mix file types even within one edit session. But just to try to keep things consistent, we'll actually still re up convert that to to 24 bit 48 kilohertz, which is our house standard. Standard, uh, both in Dillette. Uh, we chose that house standard because we knew as integrating with Axia, uh, 2448 was going to give us the, the cleanest transition as Dalit played out onto the Axia network without having to add in an extra layer of, of uh, sample rate conversion. Um, okay. Once in Dalit, they'll edit at 2448. Um, they'll put together their package. When the package is complete, um, at that point in time, it'll stay 2448 all the way throughout playout until it gets to the actual uh, audio encoder if it's going to the web or uh, as a stream or, you know, uh, codec trans- uh, audio encoding, I guess, if it's becoming an uh, MP3 or, or whatever it might be for a podcast and that sort of thing. Um, so, so really for so, us, so- go ahead, sorry. Oh, I was going to ask, with, with your rock station, with The Current, uh, I know you play a lot of, of local music, and I'm sure some of the submissions there are a little questionable in terms of audio quality. I know we have the same issue here. Mm-hmm. Uh, is there anything you can do to fix those up, or 
do you have guidelines even for the people who submit the music? Typically for us, we, we will actually push folks to, to submit a higher quality audio file, if at all possible. So we're, we're not playing too many MP3s or things that somebody just dropped off. Um, not to say that it never happens, um, but there the, are folks who are actually on the audio engine side. They, they have good ears. Um, they will typically give everything a listen before it goes to the radio. We... Um, rarely, if ever, have folks, you know, I mean, I'm not going to say we've never played something off of somebody's iPod, but it, it sure. is very much the exception, not the norm. Um, same thing, we, we have really pushed to not, you know, do YouTube videos or, you know, grab something off the internet and play directly, both because it doesn't sound good and because you necessarily sound good, but also because you're, you're, you know, always running that risk that, you know, something goes into buffering in the middle of the tune and now you've, you know, destroyed the listener experience because you're not providing good content anymore. You know, it's just like a CD player dying or something, but more, much more likely to happen. Um, but I know for, I, I know for, you know, a lot of times now for music, the big thing is SoundCloud, you know, trying to rip something yeah. from SoundCloud or, you know, something yeah. like that. And, you know, that's a challenge I run into, you know, handling the sure. audio at my station is, you know, setting up those guidelines and trying to get them to understand that it's not just because I like to make rules, but, uh, you know, exactly. it is, you know, those sorts of things while they sound good, uh, you know, on their own to the computer speakers, once you, you know, you put it through an audio chain that actually has some, some high end audio processing, boy, it's hard, it's hard to fix that after a while, but uh, exactly. I, I see well, that yeah. as being one of the challenges, you know, of, of playing Certain. local music, especially. So certainly no. I mean, it's and, and typically, if if we do have something you know that's a new release that's only available of MP3 or something, if they feel they just have to get out of the air, you know, we have to play this today. We can't wait for anything. That they will put that MP3 on the air. You know, they'll they'll, they'll do a a couple of cuts from something. Um, but once the a, a higher resolution copy becomes available, it, it's part of their workflow to go back and update that file in the system to make sure that uh, at least for the long term we're we're, we're playing something that's you know better i guess in that respect um the other half of that of course is we're lucky enough to have an in you know not not we always have this opportunity but we have an in-house recording studio um you know a lot of our local content that we play isn't you know joe schmo's band sending us an mp3 but it's us going to one of their concerts and actually recording something or inviting uh -huh. them in for an for an in studio and actually having complete artistic control um, you know, in, in, in addition to our Axia system and our, in our studio, we've got a full, I think it's 110 fader Neve console, um, you know, very, very uh, uh, acoustically isolated room that's you know, basically well set up for, for live opportunities. Um, and the great thing about that, of course, is it's not just a, a recording of, you know, somebody playing, but it's also an opportunity for hosts to be in the room, to do interviews, to have a conversation and bring more than just a performance, but bring an actual experience with the actual artist. So... That's that's something as a large organization we're very lucky to have those opportunities. Hmm. Hey, uh, okay, so here's a here's a. Uh, I'm really curious from this technical point of view. You guys have have you care about your audio quality? You have an, an, a responsive audience that that obviously you're talking to the audience back and forth. Um, which which streaming audio formats have you guys decided to standardize on at this point in technology? And is it any different for podcasts that people might download from your sites? Sure. Um, so uh, streaming, we're streaming MP3 and AAC. Um, we have dropped Windows Media. We were doing Windows Media for a long time, but but we were finding uh, that was actually one of our projects. As as we um, take a step back with within Stream Guys, we we've, we've expanded our infrastructure and 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 uh, both on there, you know, what we pay f pay them for there, and as far as load balancing things, and and gone through a couple of conversions. As we've done that, we had the opportunity to to drop Windows Media, but be able to divert customers over to our MP3 or AAC streams. Um, as far as podcasts go, I believe we're also MP3 and AAC. Um, I think if you go to our website, if you dig back into our archives, you can still find some real real audio, but uh, very rarely anymore. And we've been going through a process of trying to uh, convert that to actually. Uh, be a more modern codec, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, and then along those same lines, uh, um, well, yeah, I mean, I, I don't remember the bit rates right off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I believe our MP3 streams are 64, 128. Um, AAC, I think, is 64. I don't remember if we have a 128 option for that or not as well. So we, we were very deliberate about that, though. We did a lot of listening, testing, um, spent a mm -hmm. lot of time with folks. Uh, with with uh, you know golden ears folks within our own teams to to make sure that the things we were putting up were encoding at the levels that we wanted them to and, and sounded good. So, and I'm sorry, is that is that the same for uh, uh, real time streaming 
versus mm-hmm. podcasts? Like if I go download some audio from one Th- of your websites? That, that, is, that is correct. Yeah. The MP3 for sure, I'm about 98% sure that our podcasts also have AAC options most of the time. And then for sure the web streams are MP3 and AAC. Okay. Okay. Yeah, earlier you had mentioned FLAC. Do you, do you have use for FLAC uh, in your facility? Um, primarily, we're, we're not broadcasting or, or making directly public uh, any FLAC content at this point, but we use it primarily for some of our remote reporters. Um, we have bureaus throughout the state where we have reporters, in, in, ah. I guess, embedded, for lack of a better word. Um, oftentimes, <laughs> they'll have a, a, we have a, a state ranging MPLS network that, that we uh, get through CenturyLink, um, that MPLS network becomes our backbone then for a lot of our content pushing. But oftentimes we're bandwidth limited to, you know, maybe only a couple of megs worth of bandwidth for, for pushing files. And if they're in a hurry, you know, I mean, a, a wave file will, will crush that network connection pretty quickly for a little while. Um, a a f- FLAC file is oftentimes the, the most efficient way to get something across the network to us here. So, so they're using uh, FLAC. Oops, go ahead. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'm, uh, what I was going to ask next is, you know, okay, so inside your facility, uh, you've got uh, an audio over IP network, a high speed network. You've got, you're using Axia and Livewire. So this is all linear, uncompressed, uh, low latency. And that's all the stuff in your, in your uh, two dozen or more studios plus all the workstations that you've got. And then your public facing streams. Uh, tend to be these lower bit rate, of course, uh, as you mentioned, 64 kilobit and, and uh, maybe 128 kilobit streams that we'd all be fairly accustomed to. So you've got great uh, audio for, you know, as the contribution audio, and you, you knock it down to a low bit rate for distribution. Um, so I'm curious about your other infrastructure. What about going from your St. Paul offices to the various transmitter sites? Is any of that audio over IP? And if it is, is it is any of it linear, or is any of it uh, compressed? Sure. Well, um, we're we're slowly. Well, we, we have a combination of things. Um, of course, mm-hmm. as again looking at redundancy, we we've implemented things usually in, in multiple iterations or or a variety of manners just to make sure that we can actually, you know, if if a system ex- experiences a failure, that we can continue to provide content to our our sites or whichever. So uh, for our primary, uh, we have. 37 radio stations around the state, um, as well as a couple in another, a couple of other states. Uh, I think we have one in Idaho, a couple in Iowa, and um, South Dakota and Michigan, if I remember right, off the top of my head. Um, we're using actually a, a Pico Digital uh, XDS system, satellite delivery system, DVB, mm-hmm. uh, in order to actually distribute our audio to those sites. So we have satellite downlink dishes. Um, uh, I believe we're encoding at 250. Uh, I think it's 256. Um, MPEG-2, if I remember correctly, for that system, um, and you know, as as a primary delivery. But then, uh, in addition to that, Pico Digital's XDS system has the ability to stream. So we many of our sites have uh, uh, are on the MPLS. The other sites that aren't have standalone internet connections that with a, a uh, Cisco VPN back to our primary facility here. Um, Pico Digital can send a stream over that device in order to, or over those connections as a backup audio op, you know, option with a switcher at the site to choose. In addition to that, some of our sites, and then as we're doing for more and more of our remotes, uh, we're using a lot of Comrex gear. So we're using Comrex accesses um, and or Comrex bricks, depending on the appropriate application, mm-hmm. uh, in order to provide uh, an actual link between different sites, whether it's a temporary thing for you know a news conference, or um, as we're doing, for instance, for our Sun Valley site, a pair of Comrex brick units that are uh, the full time STL to that site, as we weren't able to put in a, a satellite dish. So it, it's a variety of things for that as well. For most of those devices, the, the debate there, the the trade off is of course uh, audio quality versus bandwidth, and then latency is a factor in there. Yeah. Um, Typically, we're using uh, AAC codecs, the, the AAC codec for that, and usually I think it's between 128 and 256. Um, yeah. if, we, if it can be bumped higher, we go higher, but it's you know very dependent on usually the unique situation for each individual site. Wow. Chris, we're going to be out of time here pretty soon. Uh, you got any follow-up questions here at the end? No, I'm actually. I was just intrigued by listening uh, about the the content distribution and and you know using the the uh, the satellite versus the internet and those sorts of things. Um, but I, you know, I mean, uh, kind of what I'm taking away here is that uh, it's a very non traditional uh, sort of setup in terms of of how radio stations go with with technology. Um, how, how has your experience been integrating all of this equipment from different vendors? For example, Axia 
Comrex, uh, Dalit, Enco, those sorts of things. I, I know that, you know, fortunately they sort of talk the same language, but, you know, has that been a challenge trying to get all those things to work together? Sure. I mean, it's um, everything is an opportunity and everything has the uh, opportunity for a challenge. Um, (laughs) Typically, what we found is if if we can um, work with the vendor and if the vendor sees it as an opportunity for them, you know, for for other potential customers, they they are interested in um, partnering on this technology. Now, usually there are some growing pains. You know, I'll say that our Axia Dalit integration, um, the integration between the two pieces of software actually was, you know, very solid from the beginning, um, but we we went through a couple of iterations of hardware, as an example, in order to um, make sure that you know we we were getting. It's not, it wasn't so much the integration that was a point, but it was you know having a, 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 a high CPU demand piece of software that's you know taking a lot of system resources um, on the Dalit side in combination with an IP audio driver that's trying to do you know low latency, um, full resolution, twenty four bit you know forty eight kilohertz audio streaming for lack of a better word. Um, all off one box, you know. So th- our challenges have oftentimes not been co- getting companies to be willing to do the integration, but it's figuring out exactly how to host that on the hardware properly, um, and then you know again coming back to the, to, the, to the redundancy aspect of things, um, making sure that when we put any of those systems together, that it's not in a way in which uh, a, a failure on a piece of hardware or a failure in a network segment can you know cause an outage. Um, you know, a, a perfect example of that, and you know, for this is a con- constant growing process. I mean, an example for that right now, we're in the middle of a, a large Axia core replacement project where we're moving away from our 60, Cisco 6500 that was installed six years ago, uh, or mm. seven or eight years ago, I guess now, to a new Nexus 7 dual core platform that allows us to, to dual land everything. It gives us you know complete redundancy. We can lose half of our core and you know keep, theoretically, every switch and every part of the building still running. But the challenge there is getting that to you know function as far as dual homing on PCs, dual homing on servers, and you know making sure that um, you know even connecting that Axia network to our business network, which is actually you know sometimes frowned upon, but is actually a, a primary core part of our infrastructure. Making sure all of that can always stay up and running, and you know no one segment doesn't take down the rest of the system and cause a problem. So, wow. Wow, you guys have got a great plant there. I've, I look forward to coming back and seeing this after you've done this, did this, uh, this core switch replacement because you guys put a good amount of effort into getting your Axia system, which normally is on its own physical uh, network, um, to also be present for all your, your business uh, needs, uh, including all those workstations that were out there. Uh, so I'm, I'm eager to see how, how that's going to go, replacing yep. those core switches with something new. Hey. April 29th is our cutover date. We've uh, uh, promised our bosses that we won't take any audio outage, and uh, <laughs> my fingers <laughs> are crossed. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> uh, it, it, it's, it's a fun project. It's uh, actually uh, excited, and I know you're wrapping it up here in a second, but excited we're getting to go down to uh, uh, Cisco Labs down in uh, Omaha, and we're actually going to completely mock up everything with uh, a copy of our existing core, the new core, and the, and the other gear, and uh, putting everything together as far as the code goes step by step and figure out exactly how to make this cutover happen without taking any outages so definitely wow. definitely again another you know another way to, to, to honor our commitment to our listeners and try to make sure that the, syst- the systems that we put together uh, deliver the content as as close to 100 percent of the time as it can doug i have enjoyed this immensely even though probably half the time you're talking over my head <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> your net your environment there with doing so much content is just amazing it's you know it's like having just dozens and dozens of radio stations and Lots of professional talent. It just boy, it, it, it's it's hard to to imagine for a guy who for years was a workaday engineer at a small group. So I'm glad that you've uh, broadened my horizons a, a bit on this, and I can start to see this really big picture. Chris, any any last comments? Parting? No, I'm just like I said. I'm, I'm glad uh, I'm glad we were able to get you on as a guest. I, you know, a lot of what you're doing is a little, you know, I always kind of joke about that. You know, we've had, in fact, one of our, uh, one of our guys used to work at The Current, and, you know, I always kind of joke that I'm about two or three years behind you guys. So I, I watch <laughs> real intently with what you guys are doing sure. as kind of a template because I'm sure that's the direction that we're going to be going. So it's it was real interesting to hear, you know, hear what you're doing. And, you know, I, I just have to say from from my point of view, um, that's one of the great things about working in uh, in public media, especially, is that you know we're given a lot of opportunity to work with things like this uh, because you know it's become a whole lot more than just about being on the radio. You know, with these alternate streams of content, 
and all these different types of uh, ways to create new content. Um, you know, it's an interesting opportunity and something that uh, I think is really neat and, and is, um, I think, as an, as an engineer or a technology guy, uh, keeps things interesting because you're always kind of forced out of your comfort zone and pushed to go, you know, up to that next level. And I think that's always a lot of fun. So I, I was, it was great to hear, you know, this past hour some of the things that you're doing. Oh, absolutely. I, you know, I've always thought the, the fun part of this job, and especially work in public radio, for me, is it's not necessarily putting out fires. You know, it, it's it's not to say it's never stressful, but it's oftentimes the the challenges come in trying to figure out how to do new things. And I think our funding model helps a lot with that, as as well as um, just a, a good attitude as far as our management that you know there's opportunities to make things better. It's not just you know break fix. So no, it definitely keeps the job interesting, and uh, it's fun to go on. It was fun to have the opportunity to come on your show and and chat about this for a little while. We're going to have uh, one of Doug's uh, other colleagues uh, on a future show um, uh, coming up. That's uh, Tom Nelson, and and Tom uh, does a ton of engineering uh, there at at uh, Minnesota Public Radio. So we're uh, excited to have him on probably sometime after after NAB. We got to go. Doug Rowe uh, at Minnesota Public Radio, the Media Production Systems Manager, has been our guest. Uh, Chris Tarr was able to join us today. Another co-host. Uh, Chris is with. Uh, Tell us about your website, Chris, where you have some forums. What's that? Broadcastengineering.info is the name of the site, and it's a great place to exchange uh, ideas, questions, thoughts, whatever you want about uh, the discipline of broadcast engineering. We have a bunch of great guys on there. And as a matter of fact, uh, there's a story there that uh, we, we've been around. The site's been around for, I think, seven years now. Uh, there is a radio station. I won't get into a whole lot of detail, but was conceived, planned, built, and put on the air Using entirely using help from from that forum. So, you know, a guy came on several years ago and said, "Hey, I'm looking to get a radio station on." We had guys help him find the allocation, help him walk through the process of getting it, help them pick out gear, how answer questions about building it, and so from start to finish, was able to put a radio station on the air. So, so how it's cool. kind of neat stuff over there. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. All right, thanks for joining us. Our show's been brought to you by uh, the Telos Alliance and the Telos Direct Current newsletter. Let me encourage you to go to telosalliance.com, scroll all the way to the bottom, and over on the left-hand side, there's a little button, subscribe to Direct Current. It's funny, pithy, informative, and you'll find out some cool things, like you'll find out about the new five-year warranty on every Telos Alliance product. So check it out if you would. Uh, we're going to be back next week with uh, another show just before NAB, and we'll also do a show live from the NAB floor uh, in two weeks from today. So, uh, glad to hope you'll join us for that. We're going to have a good time there, and we'll see who we can grab from the floor and, and talk with. Uh, appreciate Andrew Zarian being our producer in uh, New York City, and uh, we're going to see you next week on This Week in Radio Tech. Bye-bye, everybody.